Hello everyone, and welcome to my Kubernetes 120 release note overview. So as some of you know, I'm making a point to go over the Kubernetes release notes and giving you my opinions on the most important ones. So let's get into it. So Kubernetes 120 is what some are calling the raddest release yet. Don't take my word for it. So we got a lot of little things that uh, add up to a lot of big awesomeness. And that's right. English is a difficult, imprecise cacophony of a language, but sadly, it's the only one I speak. So let's get moving into this. Let's get let's get on with this. So first off, what everyone is talking about and probably is maybe one of the least important things, I don't know, is the deprecation of Docker. That's right, you're hearing it right. Docker is getting the middle finger by Kubernetes. Not really. Um, let's break this down to really understand what's going on here, why it's happening and why a year ago, we could have told you that it would happen. Um, to be honest, uh, you need to know quite a bit about the history of Docker and Kubernetes and containers to really understand why this is happening. And I think I'm going to do a video at some point on the whole history of containers anyways, because it would make a lot more sense. But let's be clear. First off, Docker will still kind of work. Kind of, yeah, kind of work. Uh, more importantly, Container D, a lower part of the Docker stack, will continue to work. Docker itself is designed as an easy to use user interface with a lot of bundled tools to create and manage containers. It wasn't designed as a Kubernetes runtime. Now, Container D is, and it is an OCI compliant uh, Kubernetes runtime. So, all you really need to do is update it to be, if you're using Docker, is to use Containerd, the backend that Docker was using anyways. So don't worry, it's a bit confusing, but Docker uses a bunch of tools, and some of those tools are Run-C and Containerd. Well, Containerd uses Run-C, and there's a whole stack of things to build and use and manage containers. Now, the Kubernetes CRI is the container runtime interface, um, and this is defined by the Open Container Initiative and our compatible runtimes, meaning that Kubernetes needs a CRI runtime, and Container D happens to be a CRI runtime. Con Docker is not. So what does this mean for you? Probably pretty much nothing. Uh, Docker shim was a really crappy shim created to solve a problem. The, the problem was running containers on Docker, the main tool at the time for, I mean, at the time of Kubernetes, Docker really was what popularized containers. And so it was the tool to use. And so this shim was a translation layer, think WSL1, a translation or wine is another good translation. The Docker shim was a translation layer just to translate from the Kubernetes runtime interface to what Docker would understand. But the Docker shim has lots of problems, like it can't use C groups v2, and that's a big problem. C groups v2 is awesome um, and solves a lot of problems of C groups v1. And I mean, it's called the Docker shim because it's a shim. Shims aren't designed to be used or permanent, unless you're talking about a door shim. For some reason, those are kind of part of the, anyways. It's going to be at least three releases. So you have until 123 to install, uh, to handle this. That being said, uh, that's the soonest they could re remove it. Doesn't mean that they'll necessarily actually remove it. I've seen highly used things uh, languish on a few uh, iterations. And then on top of this, it's only going to really affect you if you have a hard dependency on Docker. Uh, this, the only thing that really comes to mind would be like Docker in Docker scenarios where you're actually using the Docker sock. Um, other than this, I, I don't know of many hard dependencies on Docker as your runtime. Not only this, I want to make it clear that Docker creates compatible containers. So 
if you use Docker in your build, if you use it to build your images or anything like that, or just on a day to day to manage containers on your machine, you don't need to change that. Those images, all of that will still work with Kubernetes and you can continue doing that and using that just how you have beforehand because again, they're building compliant containers. So there's no reason to fret about trying to find different tooling because I know that Docker is quite a bit easier than some of the other tooling that exists out there currently. So I almost made a keep calm and Docker on shirt. I thought that would be funny, but I didn't make it because that was too much work. If I had a bigger YouTube channel, I would have made that shirt for you guys. There you go. Make me a big YouTube channel so that I'll make you guys custom funny t-shirts. Let's move on to something that I actually consider to be quite a bit more important than the deprecation of Docker Shim. That would be the fixing. It was a bug of the exec probe timeout. Why I think this is a big deal is because actually this could cause failures in your cluster when you update. So the exec probe timeout actually was indif indefinite. It, it, uh, it didn't care what you said. You could set it to one second and it would wait forever. That being said, the default, if you don't set this in your spec file, is one second. So if your container needs more than one second, your pod needs more than one second, this is going to fail uh, starting now. So also, maybe you did set it, but it was shorter than the amount of time you need. Maybe you set it to five seconds and you need six seconds. So this is something to understand, be aware of, and know because going forward, it could cause failures in your Kubernetes cluster. And that's really the last big important thing that I think that we need to worry and deal with. Uh, everything else is quality of life. The first thing up would be the graceful node shutdown. Now, why I consider this a good quality of life is Prior to this update, if you wanted to shut down a node, you need to coordinate and drain the node prior to shutting the node down. If you didn't do this, you ran the, ch uh, the chance of uh, leaving a file handle open and corrupting data and information. So it, it was kind of risky to shut it down without doing all of the other steps. But all of the other steps were a lot of work just to shut down a node. So the graceful node shutdown looks to solve this by um, letting the kubelet listen for systemd inhibitor locks. Uh, that's probably a whole video itself, but the end story is on Linux, if you have alpha features enabled and the feature gate uh, you'd be able to just shut down the node and it's going to cordon and drain the node automatically all of itself and make sure that you don't have any problems. Now, since it's an alpha, I probably wouldn't use it until it's in beta and you don't have to use a feature gate, but this is really useful. And in the future, hopefully soon, this will be released into beta and general availability. So you can start using them and dealing with nodes in a little bit more of a sane way. So that's really cool and I'm really looking forward to when this is released in general availability to be used because I think that it will just solve a lot of problems people have when they accidentally shut down a node in a non-graceful way. All right, so the next thing is runtime class and it is graduating to stable. If you don't know what the runtime class is, the runtime class is the way that you can run multiple runtimes in a single cluster. What do you mean by runtimes? I mean VMs and Containerd and Cryo. You can run different container runtimes in the back end and you can, in your spec file, you can define which one it needs to run that spec file. You can have a mixed workload in a single cluster using this. And it's graduating to stable. It was in beta. You could have used it without a feature gate. I don't generally cover stable unless I just think that it's a really useful thing that sh people should know about. And the runtime class falls under this. If you're wanting to run mixed workloads, you need to know about the runtime class. Do know that because the runtime class is going from beta to stable, your spec file will have to change from v1 beta 1 to v1 as its API group. Otherwise, it's, it's going to be using the beta version. And the beta version will get deprecated and will get removed and will fail eventually. So make sure to update your spec files to v1. Along these lines, pod, or not pod, 
PID limits are now GA. Having the ability to limit PIDs per pod and node to pod PID isolation. That's a mouthful to say, and I'm surprised that I said it all. You might wonder why this is important, and it comes down to a lot of things. First, more isolation is always a good thing. But second, uh, Linux can at max support 4,194,304 PIDs. But I say at max, uh, the default is 32,768. No, I had to look both of those numbers up. I don't know them off the top of my head. But it gets to be a little bit more complicated than that because of CPU thrashing. So just because those are the numbers doesn't mean that your computer can or your node can actually run that many PIDs and even more importantly, it can't do it efficiently. As soon as you start thrashing your processor, the entire efficiency of your system tanks. And so to do that, you need to make sure that you have sane limits on PIDs so that you don't run into these types of issues. And it's generally available. Now it was in beta beforehand, so you're all good and set. You don't have to do anything special, but it's in GA and you should know about it so that you can, especially if you're really packing your nodes, you know what a uh, sane limit for your nodes are. An interesting thing that's coming up is Kubadium, the open source de facto way of creating cluster Kubernetes clusters in a very compliant way, is changing how it labels its control plane nodes. And it's now going to be control dash plane instead of master. Now for the next three releases, it's actually going to double label. So you're going to have the control plane and the master label. And you're going to have to, if you want to untaint your control plane, like you want to do a single node cluster, you're going to have to remove both of them. So going for the next couple of releases, you're going to have to make sure that you use both or remove both. And then going forward in 123, you're going to just use the control plane one. So it's not a big deal, but it could take you by surprise if you only remove uh, untainted the master label and it still wouldn't run no workloads on your control plane. So I wanted to bring that up as something that might catch you by surprise. Another thing that changed was the Kubernetes Cube API server identity. Now, this is an entire video, so I'm not going to go into it, but it enables better load balancing and uh, efficiency at the control plane level and is quite a good update. Something I do want to talk about is the kubectl debug graduates to beta. So prior to this, you had to not only enable a kubelet uh, feature gate flag, but you had to type in kubectl alpha debug. Now with the kubectl debug in beta, you can use this out of the box without a feature gate flag. And it means that it's slightly more stable and yeah, it's really good. The kubectl debug is the one biggest thing this release that I was looking forward to. This is probably the largest quality of life and should have been earlier in this video. kubectl debug allows you to do a host of debugging from allowing you to start a container on a node with debug tools mounted to the root file system so you can debug the host to allowing you to debug a container. Let's talk about distro list containers. I hate the word distro list, by the way. I'm gonna make a video on that. I am, I don't agree with the industry a lot, a lot of the time, I guess, but distro list I think is a bad word to use. But anyways, if you've ever run a distro list container, it has none of the tools that you need to debug that container if it's having problems. And one of the common ways to do this is with a sidecar and kubectl debug gives you the ability to create that sidecar with a container that has all the tools that will mount into the other container so you can use those debugging tools in your problem child container. So it's this type of stuff that kubectl debug gives you, and it's really some fantastic features that you should be looking forward to using when you have issues going forward. The other note on this is you should stop using kubectl alpha debug. Now that will still work, but it's been deprecated and won't be updated. So you should 
continue on, use kubectl debug, even though the other one will still work. In 123, it could be removed. So if you have any tooling rem around that, remember to do update that. Okay, another thing that could catch you by surprise and cause some errors is that the pod host name as a fully qualified domain name or an FQDN is now in beta, meaning you can use this. And what this will do is instead of using a short host name, it will use its fully qualified domain name as its host name. Now there's one caveat to this that I wanna warn you about. In Linux, the host name can be at maximum 64 characters. And if it's, if your FQDN is longer than 64 characters, your pod will fail to start. So if you do enable this, you also have to go through the precautions to ensure that your FQDN will never be longer than 64 characters. Those were my highlights of the Kubernetes 120 release. I hope that you liked them. I hope you found them useful. I do want to encourage you to go and look through the release notes yourself because this these are just the general things I found helpful. There might be something that's highly specific to something you're doing with the Kubernetes cluster that you need to know about. There's a lot of other things that happened. These were just what I considered the highlights from a developer's point of view uh, and from a quality of life point of view. I did try to make sure I called out anything that I thought was going to cause problems. But again, you need to go and look at them yourself. Uh, links to all of those things are below. And I'm also releasing a few blog posts that talk in further detail about things like Docker Shim, as well as just uh, other people's overviews if you wanna read them, ones that I thought were really good. And uh, yeah. This also doesn't cover anything in the container runtimes themselves. So generally Cryo releases a new version and I did not cover any information on Cryo. Cryo and its release will be uh, linked below. So if you're wanting to know if anything in the container runtime itself changed, go ahead and check those out. Otherwise, thanks for watching. Hope this was helpful. Hope it was a as fast as possible, highest level Kubernetes 120 change log and uh, Stick around to see some new videos. If you like this video, please go ahead and subscribe and like the video. It will let the Google algorithm, Google, YouTube, YouTube algorithm, know you like the video and to recommend more. Uh, if you find my videos helpful, don't forget to share them and let other people know that they exist out there. Any support is great for me. Um, I put a lot of time into trying to make the best videos I can for you guys. Also, if you have something that would make these videos better for you, I know people have told me my font is too small or to use more graphs or diagrams. I try to incorporate all of that. So please let me know how I can make these better for you and get the information over to you better. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you guys next time.